Good morning, church. Our reading text is taken from Genesis 15. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it reads as follows. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, and the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphorites, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jerbosites. And this is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Um, Tandiwe, thank you for reading that. I left you those difficult names at the end um, to test you this weekend. Thank you for taking us through them. Um, if you can just blanket them as the Canaanites, that makes it easier and close to who they are, but all the ites there. Um, but it's a great privilege to be with you this morning, church. Um, for me and my wife, we had a very interesting story where she bailed me out. Um, it happened quite often during COVID times, especially still now, um, with Zoom calls. When I'm not there at the moment to take a call, she kind of jumps up, put the screen off, and then Tina takes a call for me and partake in that. So I've been bailed out a lot in the same way as the stories you guys shared. Um, greatly appreciative of marriage and the privileges it brings to work together as well. Um, but yeah, it's a great privilege to be with you this morning and to talk about the Word of God and how God speaks with us through His Word. Um, Thank you, Summary, for leading us so wonderfully in worship as it lines up with what we talk about this morning. So I want to pray for us and ask that God be gracious to us as we um, come to His Word this morning. Father, it's an amazing privilege to be able to take this time together, um, that our country is not at war, um, to know that we can have the religious freedom, Lord, to meet in this place this morning. Lord, may we not take it for granted. May we know that many of our brothers and sisters in this world is going through tremendous um, persecution and suffering. 
But Lord, we need a greater reminder of this reality um, than they do this morning, Lord. We are at war with a world that is affected greatly with sin, Lord. Our lives are greatly affected with sin and the fall. And Lord, above all, we need your Spirit to work deep in our hearts um, to convict us of our sin, Lord, but above all, to convict us of who you are. Um, your righteous character, your loving Father, and, and how you continue to be the one who reaches out to humankind throughout all history um, until today, Lord. Um, may we be reminded of that afresh this morning. May you meet us where every one of us are this morning, Lord, whether we have not yet crossed the line of faith, whether we're still considering if we want to follow you, Lord, or whether we've been serving you for many years, Lord. Um, come and blow afresh through your spirit, your word into our hearts, and uh, show us the light, show us the hope that you bring in the midst of a broken world that's crying out for its Savior, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. So relationships are probably one of the most complex things that this world have ever had to deal with. Um, we see that in our different cultures and how we try to dictate how these relationships work, try to describe how they work. Um, but the two key ingredients um, in any relationship is definitely commitment and trust. Commitment leading to trust. Um, without these two things, no relationship would ever work. Um, there would always be um, unsurety about it. There will be confusion. But if I know there's good commitment, it would always lead to trust um, in relationship. Think about friendship. Very simple. Um, we give commitment in our friendship to spend time with someone, to listen to someone, to answer our phone when we're busy, to show to this person, I can take this call now, you're my friend. Um, I mean this to you. Um, this happens in the contracts we sign. Think about those painful ones we have to sign with all the thousands of agreements we have to do. If it gets to your home, it gets longer. If it gets to your cell phone, it's almost longer than your home agreement. Um, but there's all these strings and checks attached to this whole contract that if I don't do this contract according to what I committed here, there will be consequences in this way. But the one in our culture that's um, probably the most popular one, and that's a universal reality, is the relationship of marriage. Okay? Marriage is the one where we give a commitment to another person that we will remain faithful to you for the rest of my life, um, and I give you as a seal of this commitment a ring so that I will remain faithful to this, and you can rest at ease that I will remain faithful to this. Um, or we give cows these days. Isn't it amazing that our Government recently, the lady won a case against her husband who's a stranger and they were just married with Labola. But it just says how marriage is built on this commitment and there is a sign that shows and should appease our hearts that this person is going to remain faithful to this commitment that I made. Um, so similar to marriage um, comes to our relationship with God. Um, there's a matter of commitment and trust that goes hand in hand with our relationship to God. Um, if you think about that, spending time with God, His people, like we do this morning, is an integral part of building our relationship with God, reading His Word, um, praying to God, um, fellowshipping with brothers or sisters outside of this meeting. Um, that all grows our faith. But something more important is needed to actually create the environment where that growth takes place in our relationship with God. Um, and there's much more at stake if we take it to that. Um, Genesis 15 is for me by far one of the most important passages that tells us in how this relationship between man and God works. What is the foundation of this commitment and trust that we come to God? So Genesis 15 is the best place to be this morning, according to my opinion. Um, this passage is not just an example for us in how God works with us, but it's also the foundation on which our relationship with God works. Um, Paul calls Abram in Romans 4 as he looks back to this passage in um, Genesis 15, um, the father of our faith. So he's the first one, he's the example for us in how this dynamic works. So we should sit here awake this morning and listen to what um, this father of our faith has done and how this relationship works. Um, 
So we learned from this passage, it's going to be obscure, and there's some obscurities in here um, to our modern day and culture, um, but it's the foundation of how this relationship of ours work with God and how it flourishes. Um, many times we as believers get stuck, we get stuck in our relationship with God, we feel, goodness, this is difficult, I'm, I'm struggling to be vibrant and, and spontaneous in my relationship with God, and I think it's because we, we miss the basic truth that God lines out for us here in Genesis 15. But also though, if you're here this morning and you're still not in a relationship with God, you're still considering whether I want to follow God, um, this is the best place to see how this relationship does work if you do make a commitment to follow our God and our Savior. So as we prayed, I hope that this passage will shed a biblical perspective for us on what our relationship with God needs, not just to survive, but actually to flourish and grow. So Abraham has been called by God in Genesis 12, those of you who might be familiar, to leave his land and to go to the place that God will show him. God promised that he will give Abraham an offspring, um, he will make him into a great nation and make him a blessing to the world in which he lives. Now this all sounds good and we can affirm that, but it's very important for us to know what has happened in world history up to this stage. Um, Genesis 3 to Genesis 11 is probably the darkest part of all biblical history. Um, things go terribly wrong. Um, it's all because of the fall that we see in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve did not believe that God said they should not eat of this tree, and we see this great result of their disobedience and unbelief. Um, Genesis 4, we have the first murder. Cain kills Abel because of jealousy. Genesis 6 verse 5, God comments, comments on the state of the world and especially the heart of man as being wicked and constantly evil. You just feel the darkness in that. Genesis 7, God saves Noah and the animals because Noah had found favor in the eye of the Lord um, and had a relationship with the Lord and he flushes out all the evil, all these evil humans that did not seek God. But then in Genesis 9, we get shocked. Everything should be fine now. All the bad people are gone. But then Noah gets drunk on wine. His children disrespect him. And we see that sin got carried through this great flood, through the life of Noah and his uh, inheritance of his people. So we learn that sin is every, in every man and that humankind is full of sin and its brokenness. Sin has affected us all. Many generations later, we come to Genesis 11, we see the apex of humankind's evil as they build this massive tower called Babel, trying to make a name for themselves and to say how impressive we are as humankind. Um, we are powerful, we are great. And this is the exact opposite from which God created humankind. Humankind was made to worship God, give Him glory, and reflect His goodness by recreating in this world, not making a name for ourselves. And this brings us then to Genesis 12, to bring a glimmer of hope to society and to humankind that God is still at work. God is calling this man Abram, who found favor in the sight of God. Um, he calls him to be a blessing to this world that is spinning out of control. Um, he's promising him a place where they're going to worship God, where they're going to show to the world how it is to live under the rule and reign of God, and he's going to give him an offspring. There's going to be people, once Abram dies, who's going to live again, and going to live under the rule and reign of God. So we enter Genesis 15 with Abraham sojourning. He does not have a place yet where to live. The place that God promised him is possessed by someone else, the Ammonites, as we read here at the end, the Canaanites, and he has no offspring of his own as God has promised. And time is ticking. Abraham and Sarah is getting older, um, this is on human terms, on paper, it's not looking great. Abram is pushing under it as we read from Romans 4, gives hope to many of us. Um, but he's getting old, okay? Sarah's getting old. It's not looking like we're going to fall pregnant. God promised us an offspring, but it's not looking like it's going to come through for us. So this sets then this perfect scene for us to learn from God and Abram in probably one of the most important conversations in the Bible between God and man. Abraham is wrestling it with his mind, can I truly trust God? Can I trust this God who made these amazing promises in this very broken world that I find myself in? 
Follow with me in verse 1. God appears to Abram in a vision and says, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield, your reward shall be very great. Abram does not hesitate to ask God about the primary issue on hand here. God, I, I, I believe this. You just came through for me in Genesis 14. Um, we overcame what happened here. But here's a greater issue at stake. What is going on with this promise that you made to me? Here are the words here of Abram. O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. You can feel the anguish in Abram's heart. He has the faith to come to God, and know God is the one who promised this. He can talk about this. But some of us have personally gone through this pain of wanting a child and not having one. It's something that we have so many stories of in family, um, friends, um, where, where people wanted to be pregnant and they struggled to get pregnant. So part of our society and the time we're living in. It's a deep, deep desire in all of us. So we can feel that feeling brewing here. But here in Genesis 15, much more is at stake than just the offspring. It's this promise that God made of this offspring. And one day from this offspring, we see this started in Genesis 3. The big theologians call it the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first gospel being promised that someone from Adam and Eve's offspring will come to crush the serpent's head. And Genesis 12 says it again, as God promises Abraham an offspring, that from this offspring someone would come. So actually the faith relies on this promise. Not just physically having an offspring, but someone from that offspring coming to crush Satan's head. And we all know that being Christ. So as it stands, Eliezer is a member of his household, and as it looks, he will probably be the one inheriting all that Abram has at this moment. Now God replies in verse 4. You guys can follow there with me. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And God brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven, number the stars, and if you are able to name them all and number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. So God not only responds to Abram and says, Abram, just believe. Just believe. You'll be okay. No, God takes him graciously. You can actually imagine this moment. God taking him by the hand, not physically, taking him outside at night and saying, Abram, look up. Look up at all these stars beautifully shining in the light. That is how much your offspring would be. God graciously shows him how massive this offspring is going to be. God sees his unbelief in this moment, and God knows he needs to meet him at this place now to convince him of how faithful he is and how abundant this offspring is going to be. Regardless of him and Sarah's age, regardless of the fact that they're not able to fall pregnant at the moment. And then the writer comments for us in verse 6, he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now I hope this strikes you as we read this passage. What is God looking from Abram to have a flourishing relationship with him? It is faith, isn't it? God is looking from his people for faith. He's requiring of us faith so that we can be in a relationship with him. And not just is it that we can be in a relationship, but what precedes that is that we need to be righteous. We cannot be in a relationship with God out of just performing in ourselves. We are sinful, we are broken, we acknowledge with Genesis 3 and the effects of that into Genesis 11 that there needs to be someone making us just. And our faith makes us just before God that we can come to Him. Hebrew 11 says, Faith is to be sure of what we hope for. Certain of what we do not see. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because whoever comes to God must believe that He exists and rewards those who seek Him. So our faith needs to be placed in God, knowing that He is the one who comes through for us as we trust and believe in Him. For our sinfulness, but as well as for living in light of our relationship with Him. That goes hand in hand. So in exactly the same way as Abram is called to trust in God, even though his situation is not looking like it's going to work out, it is not Abram's performance before God that justifies him, but his faith 
in God. Okay, there's a nuance difference there between those two ideas. Trusting that God can do what He promised and that what He will do. So this makes us think of a relationship that a father has to his children. A good father needs to make really difficult decisions as he raises his children, as many of you are fathers and mothers, um, where you need to make a difficult call that the child will probably not like. We know the tantrums that we see. But you know you can't give your child everything that they want on their terms and conditions. That child needs to trust and learn to grow that you are having good intentions in mind that by not giving you what you want at this moment is going to be good for you in the long run. And it's the same type of dynamic that we see playing out here. Abram is wanting these promises to happen now at this moment on his terms, but God is delaying. God is teaching Abram something here. God is deeply engaging with him and growing his faith through what is going on here. So drawing from this passage and the rest of the Bible and knowing from my limited experience, I'm very sure that every Christian sitting here this morning have situations where we're struggling to trust God. Every one of us have those. Situations where we're struggling to believe that God is in control. That God is working in these challenges that I face at this moment. Situations where our age is too old, where we are barren, not feeling like we are successful and growing in what we are hoping to be. Things look bad on paper. On paper it's looking hopeless, as if God has forgotten you. You're struggling at work probably to find work. It might be you. It might be relationship issues as we started out with this morning. Personal struggles with yourself, your health, your own sanity and just dealing with the world. Maybe struggling to be a good parent. Not that I know anyone said they are good parents ever. <laughs> it is crazy. It's difficult. We have so many challenges in our lives as believers. And that's not because we're in the wrong place. That is actually exactly where God is calling us to be. To be in this world that is actually feeling completely out of whack. It's not that we made a sinful decision. Yes, you have. But it's not that that's making it hopeless at that moment. God is having you exactly where He's wanting you to be. You name it, you name the situation, that is where God is calling us. And God is placing us in these hopeless situations on paper so that we will grow in our faith with Him. That we don't get the things we want on our terms, but that we become more convinced that, you know what, my God is in control. I don't know exactly how he's going to get through this barren moment. But he promised he will. And that all things will work out for good. For our relationship with God to flourish, we'll need to press in into these moments that feel so hopeless. To be honest, when I came to faith as a young believer, I believed that God will make my life easier on my terms. God will give me the things that I want. These deep needs that I have. And as I'm growing older, I'm believing more and more that this is the exact opposite to expect in this Christian life. God places us in difficult, hopeless situations on our side so that we will grow in our faith and trust in Him. So that He would look powerful as He comes through and I grow in my faith in His capabilities. That He's the one who will provide for us. This does not mean that Christians must become fearful and that God is constantly going to bring chaos and calamity over my life. There's a distinction here. Now, His promises are so powerful that He promises, despite the hopelessness that I face now, or will face in the time to come, will work out for good. Isn't that an amazing promise? So God sees what happens in Genesis 3 as the whole world is fallen under sin. We see how um, Paul talks about in Romans that the creation is crying out for God to come back. But in the midst of this time of the world crying out for God to come back, God promises, believer, everything will work out for good in the end. My child, keep on believing. These things will work out for good in the end. God is our shield and our strength. Um, he's not going to go back um, on His promise. So if you're not a Christian here this morning and you're still considering your relationship with the Lord, you might say, wait, this is too complicated. I'd much rather live life on my terms and provide for myself, build myself a massive amount of security on my own terms. That is a lie. 
sin has affected your world as well. Things are going to go wrong at some stage. And you will need to stand and turn towards something or someone more powerful than yourself. Whether it's your health that will fail, your own wit and strength will deteriorate. But you need something stronger than yourself to put your faith in. You're not strong enough on yourself. So, this brings us then to this important thing um, of wrestling with our relationship with God. Um, that our faith needs to be vibrant and strong to take us through these difficult moments. And luckily, our passage didn't stop here. Best is still to come. And I'm going to try and underline for us how this faith is actually working out in this relationship with God. So Abraham believed God regarding his offspring, but regarding this land, he was still not sure. I mean, he had these powerful Canaanites still living in this land that God promised. And he's asking God in verse 8, Lord, how do I know that I'll possess this, uh, this land? And God responds in this uncommon manner for us as we read it with our modern eyes. He tells Abram, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Cut them in half, except for the birds to be placed opposite each other. And this was a popular custom in the time of how people made contractual agreements with one another. Try alluding to that, but not exactly the same. The terms and conditions here were way worse than the ones we have in our contra contracts today. Usually what would happen is the two people will bring one of these animals, they would cut it in half, and then both parties would walk right through the middle of these two animals. If you were poor, you would bring these doves or pigeons, things that you could afford or get easily, place them opposite each other. Or if you were very wealthy, you would bring a heifer, um, cut it in half, or in between, in the middle class, you'll bring a goat, um, trying to force that on the passage. But what you communicate as you walk through these cattle or the, the animals that's been slaughtered is that you and the person walking through this communicate to each other that you can kill me like this animal was killed if I don't remain faithful to this covenant that we make to each other. Serious, eh? Um, not like our contracts today that you just get a good attorney to work you out of this. It's like if I am convinced that this partner in which I walk through this contract is not remaining faithful, he said that he, he or her would take it upon themselves to be killed if I don't remain faithful. Rather kill me than carrying on like that. I think it's the missing link in our contracts today. Um, but back to our story here. So Abram is waiting on the Lord. He knows, you can see Abram, this is not a new thing. That's how contracts happened in those times, a covenant. So Abram is waiting for the Lord that they make this covenant. He brought the animals, the animals are slaughtered, um, exactly the way it should be. It is feeling abundant in that we have the hypha up to the, the doves that he's putting there. But as he's waiting on the Lord, there's birds coming, birds of prey, they want to eat on this. But he drives them away and then we hear the striking thing. Um, Abram falls asleep. A deep darkness falls over him. And God tells Abram in a dream that his offsprings will be sojourners, afflicted for 400 years, and they will come back to this land that God has promised. And as the sun has gone down in verse 17, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. The writers tell us then in verse 18 that on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring I give this land. So what has just happened here? What is missing from this standard way of making a contract? It's Abram, isn't it? Two people is needed to walk through there, but only God did. Isn't this crazy? So Abram had to be awake and saying, God, I'm walking through you with you in this contract, so that if one of us are unfaithful to this promise, that we will take it upon ourselves. So what has happened, God was the fire pot and the flaming torch, as the writer says here, that passed through these pieces without Abram being implicated if there's contractual break by any of the two parties. In other words, God takes it upon himself to pay with his life if Abram does not remain faithful to God. Isn't that amazing? 
If Abram acts in unbelief, anywhere from now onwards, it will be upon God to pray for Abram's sins. Not Abram. God will pray. God walked through that covenant by himself. And it does not take long for Abram to sin, isn't it? Right the next chapter. Sarah becomes disobedient, tells Abram, I have intercourse with my slave, and then at least we'll have an offspring. God's taking too long to come through with us. And Abram acts on that. He sends a chapter next to this one. And this is the gospel, my friends. That is what God is explaining to us here in Technicolor. This is the really important part to listen to if you're asleep already. God took it upon Himself to pay for our unbelief so that we can become righteous through our faith in Christ. Isn't that amazing? God never failed in His promises to Abram. He got his offspring from his wife. Um, he remained true and is still remaining true to his covenant today. Jesus Christ came to earth to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death we couldn't die, to overcome sin and death, and to pay for our unfaithfulness and our unbelief towards God. Our contract breaking was paid for by God himself. For the rich, for the middle class, the poor, Whoever comes to him in faith, anyone is welcome, from those who can afford the most expensive to those who can hardly afford a pigeon and a dove. Friends, the only way to have a vibrant relationship with our Father in all circumstances is to be very aware of the reality that God took it upon himself to save us and sustain us. My faith and your faith is very volatile, it comes and it goes. To know in these times that God is the one who took it upon himself to pay for my sin of unbelief is not just freeing, but it also empowers me to ch challenge these difficult times that might come ahead. Knowing that it's upon God to get me through this. It's not my own performance that makes me right with God, but it's the fact that Christ performed on our behalf. And I put my faith in Christ. The word the theologians work with that, they call it an alien righteousness. So it's a righteousness that's foreign to myself. My righteousness is not within myself. My righteousness is in someone else, in Christ. That's where my righteousness is. So when I feel overwhelmed with the world, I'm discouraged. I can't feel I have the strength to carry on. On paper, things look like they're falling apart. I can know for sure that Christ already performed. And this is the amazing promise of Romans 8. As Paul reflects on this long explanation of the gospel, and he says, you know what, Christian? This is the amazing reality. God solved the primary problem in your life. The fact that you're a sinner, that you're struggling with unbelief. He sent His only Son to pay for your sin. How much more won't He provide for everything else in your life? I mean, your horizontal problem that you face here today or tomorrow at work or wherever is nothing compared to the primary problem you had. Is that you were at sin and indifference towards your Creator. You were deserving punishment. You deserve to be out of His presence. But God made it possible for you to be in a right, right standing relationship with Him. Brothers and sisters, that's such a great encouragement for us this morning. It's not on our own performance, otherwise it is our works that save us. But it's only our faith, and our faith is a gift from God. It is not something that we pride ourselves in, that I have more faith or less faith than you. It's our faith that we place in our Creator. Here, Romans 4, 16 to 25, it's quite a long passage. Um, you can maybe follow or read it later tonight when you maybe want to reflect on this again. But just hear these words, it sounds exactly like we, we've been seeing this morning. Verse 16, Paul writes, That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, talking about Abram, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abram, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gave his life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abram believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, 
so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Isn't that amazing? This is the truth of the gospel regarding this covenant that God gives to us. But this is also offensive. We must acknowledge that for our modern mind. It says that we as humankind cannot solve our own problem. Number one, we're not awake enough to walk through the covenant with our God, whether you believe in God or not. You cannot own or achieve your own righteousness. Our modern, postmodern, pan African mind tells us we can do it ourselves, and we can't. We can't be perfectly solving all our problems. We need someone from the outside to help us. We need our Creator to take this problem upon himself to solve our problems and we need to wrestle with that fact it's insulting to come to the gospel it's saying that i cannot save myself i need to put my trust in someone else and that might be you this morning and you actually looking right into the main issue of what you need to give up in order to follow god to acknowledge that i'm a sinner that i cannot come to god on my own efforts but it's only through faith in his perfect work that I can have a right standing relationship with my father and that he becomes my father and that he's the one that is my shield that comes through for me in whatever I will face in this world. Now, egos, egos don't like that. Um, it's not that I bring 10% or 1%, but we bring nothing. Only faith is what we bring. So this is where our human relationships are different to our relationship with God. In marriage or any other relationship, both parties must perform for their promises to make it work. But in our faith we grow as we become more convinced that God is the primary sustainer of our faith. As we become more convinced of His faithfulness and that we see it in the clearest by His Son being sent for our sins, to die in our place, to appease our Father's wrath, and to bring us in a right standing relationship with our Father. So that's my prayer for us this morning, that we would engage with our Father in this relationship. Let us pray. Father, thank you for Abram, but above all else, Lord, thank you for your covenant. Thank you for your Son that you've sent to walk for us through that covenant, Lord, who took it upon himself to die for our sins and unbelief. Lord, I struggle to believe, we all struggle to believe in the difficult moments of our lives. The big mountains we need to face, Lord, the things on paper that look terrible and hopeless. Lord, hurts we deal with, um, challenges, Lord, discouragement. But Lord, even good times, we struggle to believe that you're the one who provide all these things for us. Lord, I pray that for those of us here this morning who are struggling to cross the line of faith, Lord, May you convince us this morning, Lord, through your Spirit, that we need you. We can't achieve our righteousness on our own. Lord, we cannot carry on without you with us. Lord, as your children, we cry out to you that you remind us deeply about that. May we draw strength from the fact that you took it upon yourself. That you're not depending on us to pull it through and help you, but you did it by yourself, Lord. And you did it perfectly, Lord. Lord, you promise us so many things. You promise us that all will work out for good. Whatever it may be, it will work out for good, Lord. May our hearts be deeply convinced about this as we grow deeply in our relationship with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.